right? This has been the largest challenge financially, mentally, spiritually, period, that any of us in any of our lives are probably ever going to experience. Thank God, hopefully, the only time. Um, but we're still mankind. And if we don't, I've been saying this since day one, the most important thing we have to maintain and be is to be kind. Almost everything we do is also available for free online. So there's a print version, but for a long time, we've always made these things available for free. Uh, we want as many people to be able to enjoy it and experience it as we can. We have a lot of people on the staff who are artists and designers and um, writers and interested in these kind of projects anyway. I just uh, I just pulled this, this out of the oven. That's one of the recipes I've been working on. Um, there's a guy, Richard Bourdon, who's an amazing baker. Yeah, he's a slap at it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And so uh, I called him up when this all started. I had this idea of starting a cooking show for people. Hey everybody, if you're just joining us, we're gonna be getting started officially in just a minute. Wanna just welcome you to our first ever virtual Boston Talks, our Smarter Happy Hour, uh, done sort of in absentia, all by ourselves and all together physically distancing and socially coming together. Uh, we're gonna be talking tonight with uh, restaurateurs about how they are handling the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, some really great speakers lined up. I'm really excited to have you with us um, and we'll be getting started in just a minute. So thanks for coming along. I want to introduce our guests for the evening uh, who we're gonna speaking with. Uh, the way it's gonna work generally is I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes or so talking with each of our guests. And then after that 10 minute period, we're really gonna to look to that Q&A section to keep the conversation going with them, maybe for another 10 minutes or so. So uh, don't be afraid to ask away as I'm talking with the guests and we'll eventually turn to your questions and get as many of them answered as we can. So without further ado, let me kind of go around and let you know who you're gonna be hearing from tonight. Uh, first up, we'll hear from Ming Tsai of uh, Blue Ginger and public television fame. How you doing, Ming? Good, nice, thanks for having me. And yeah, it's great to be a part together. For sure. We've got uh, Katrina Jazieri and Josh Lewin uh, from Juliet in Somerville. Hey everyone, thanks for having us. And uh, we've got Air Muir, who's the guy behind Clover Restaurant. So Clover, uh, Clover's man in, in charge is with us as well. How you doing, Air? Hey everybody, I'm really happy to be here. Ming, I loved watching you uh, when I was younger. So this is a uh, I, I wish we were in the same room, but I, I'll, uh, I'll, take, I'll take the virtual connection. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, you're older than me. How's that I possible? Was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Ming, he just called you old. It's like when the room <laughs> Like now, very old. It's I'm okay. not, not the intent at all. And, it's okay, uh, dude. I am old. And, right. and Josh and Katrina, really good to see you guys. Nice you too, Air. You. All right, we're going to say bye to Josh and Katrina and Air for the time being. Uh, and I'm going to spend some time right now with Ming Tsai of Blue Ginger fame. Ming, how you feeling, man? Hello, Edgar. Uh, first of all, it's Blue Dragon now, right? We closed oh, Blue oh, Ginger a couple oh, years ago. Sorry, that's okay. Sorry, yeah, it's okay. It's all right. It's, it's all good. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's cray cray, right? It's crazy times. And, you know, I can proudly say for, for us chefs and restaurateurs in this industry, we we always do what we do in disasters, right? We, we try to step up and provide, you know, a meal, which is providing hope and, um, oh my God. And, you know, going back to what, 9-11, then Katrina, then of course, Boston Marathon bombing. And, you know, then with Jose Andres with, in the Bahamas and Haiti, and then and we're always there, but this one is so different, right? Yeah, this I, one, yeah. this one is just, we can't gather. And all the chefs, right? All the men and women and, and the restaurant owners, we're, we're, we're fraternity, right? And we don't care if we have to work 18 hour days in the Bahamas and do 25,000 meals because we get to gather and hug it out and have a tequila and all that. And that's been the hardest, right? That you don't, that we're, you know, together apart. That's, that's really hard. That's hard for every family that's not with their loved ones. And you can imagine, you know, I have parents that are in Hawaii that are 85 and 90. In, in a retirement home and so you just you, you cannot not stop thinking about what if what if and um and you can and we all done it i mean i don't know how many times you've been down your rabbit hole but i've been down it so much i have no more tears right and and when you come out of it you finally realize you know what i think air said this earlier to you live today and today's the only day you can live and and if you can somehow make a difference today and if everyone kind of does that we're going to be better off because you know we're we are 
we are better than COVID-19, right? This has been the largest challenge financially, mentally, spiritually, period, that any of us in any of our lives are probably ever going to experience. Thank God, hopefully the only time. Um, but we're still mankind. And if we don't, I've been saying this since day one, the most important thing we have to maintain and be is to be kind. We just have to be kind. And you've seen, you've seen acts of kindness across the board, which is awesome. Because today, there's three types of people in this world, right? Forget about your color of your skin, sexual identity, political persuasion. Forget all that. You are either healthy, infected, or dying. That's it. The whole world has three classes of people right now. So we have to take that person to our right and our left and bring them in, of course, social distancing, but I mean metaphorically, and take care of the people to your right and left. Because yeah. all we are homo sapiens. We are all human beings, and that's our common thread. But you're only one of three people right now. You, you cannot be out of this group of three. So knowing that, we just try to step up and do what we can. So, so you know, it's interesting because you know, as unfortunate as, as it is to hear you talk about other tragedies that have happened and, you know, you, you're a successful restaurateur, a successful chef. Um, you have a network of people around the world that you know well. And again, like, it's unfortunate, but you almost, it sounds like, had a bit of a template for how to be able to take your position and pitch in in the case of a tragedy. But as you said, this one's different. So what have you been doing or have you been able to do anything under these circumstances? Yeah, um, I, I'm very blessed that you mentioned the network of us chefs. I mean, it is, it is certainly nationwide, if not worldwide. So I voluntarily closed Blue Dragon the Friday before, I think it was Monday, it was mandated. Um, and I did that just as a quick side note because there, I took out half my tables. So I'm 50% trying to do the social distancing, right? But it didn't work. Uh, young people, my blue drag is mostly young millennials, you know, 20 to 30. They were toasting in groups to coronavirus. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's it. We're cutting this off. So we closed the next day. Um, I immediately, because uh, as a chef owner, I had, I had 28 employees of Blue Dragon. And I just knew that one, I have to take care of them as much as they possibly can. So I, I very proudly gave them each a thousand bucks extra as it, it almost covers another paycheck. Um, but I know, I know I can't give everyone 15,000 each, right? Because then I'm bankrupt, but I know, I know I had to feed them. And Christine Canvas, my chef, exec chef at Blue Dragon's like, chef, we just got it. We got to stay open and feed them and we'll just start the, you know, we'll do a no contact to go. So that Monday we started the no contact to go per CDC protocol. So it's a bag, gloves, mask, preparing the food and the, you know, the bag is put outside on a table. Your name is on it. You've already paid for the credit card. So we started that, that to go, no contact. Um, and then we made staff meal. So we reached out to the entire staff. Says, guys, we still have staff meal. Please come get it. Obviously, it's free. Um, and only a few showed up. And we're like, you know, there, there's, look, there's a pride thing. You know, wanna, you really want to have to go and wait in line and get food. And so there's all these, just the, just the shame, right? That, I mean, I, I, I can't say I have yet to wait in food for, a, you know, a wait in line for food. So there was that. And, and we continued. So we started delivering because most of them live in East Boston. So again, Christine and Gabe, my sous chef, were delivering the food to them. Um, and that was fine. But, but you know, to go food was fine. I mean, bluntly, we're doing 10% of normal revenue. So it doesn't take an accountant or rocket sciences to know you can't sustain on 10% of normal revenue. I don't care who you are, right? Um, but then fortunately, there's a great chef named Ed Lee who is a buddy of mine from Kentucky. He's, he's been on Simply Ming a bunch of times. And we've, again, once you meet a chef when, you know, this is probably 20 years ago or 15, I've met Ed. And he very smartly approached Maker's Mark. And this is a good thing. Thank God Ed does like bourbon. And Maker's Life, Maker Marks likes Ed. And, um, and the only reason I bring it out, and they, they do get a huge hats off and a huge tip of my hat. Because Ed said, hey, look, you have a budget in San Francisco and LA and Boston and New York and all these cities to do promotions and do events and whatnot. Well, you're not doing gathering events. So give me the money instead and I'll pick a chef in each city and we'll do food banks. And Maker's Mark's like, that's a great idea. We'd love to be part of that. So we did get a Boston, Ed called me to do Boston and I got seed money to at least bring back four or five of my cooks plus continue paying my salary. My three salary managers, the one that continued to go. And proudly now, 
Um, well, first, the first week was kind of slow, and no one was showing up. And we found out by speaking to our own cooks and dishwashers who live in East Boston, like, chef, we're too scared to ride the T. We're too scared to get in an Uber. That's why we're not coming. So we're like, okay, I got to solve this. So fortunately, through a great guy, uh, Todd Saunders, who used to own a bunch of food trucks, hooked me up with uh, uh, Ernie Campbell, who owns Jamaican Me Hungry, which is the restaurant in Jamaica Plain, who has a food truck. I called out Ernie and says, Ernie, look, can I use your truck? I want to bring food to East Boston. And he, he absolutely says, Chef, I'd love to help out. So now we're bringing every day, Monday through Friday, 1 o'clock, uh, almost 300 meals now. It keeps getting larger, unfortunately, um, to East Boston at 1 o'clock at the Orient Heights Tea Stop. So we're, in, we're on this right next. If you get off the Orient Heights, you'll see this. You're making me hungry. So there we're passing out the majority of our, our food. But we also have a whiteboard of toiletries. So, no, we don't have a lot of Purell, but we have, you know, not, uh, diapers and formula for people with babies, and we have raw rice and raw beans. The, for me, if you can cook a pot of rice in the Asian culture, or for the Latinos, some rice and beans, that normalcy, right? That's a little ray of hope that you actually get to cook something. So, that's been very popular, plus, the, plus all the paper goods. Um, and we do the same at Blue Dragon, seven days a week at Blue Dragon, um, three to five o'clock. But again, a lot of people aren't coming to Dragon because it's seaport and not a lot of people live by. But we're yeah. still continuing that as Dragon as well. Um, and if you want to know how you can support, go to Lee Initiative. And you can certainly give money if you have the capacity to do that. We've had a lot of our friends actually go to Amazon and drop ship toiletries as a list that we have that would be ideal if people could buy. So we got a lot of support that way. A lot of local people like John Keneally, uh, Kim Martin, Trimark, um, B&W Watercrest in Florida, they're all donating food. Uh, the, the Boston Food Bank has been an awesome partner. Uh, and the more we can get food donated, the more the seed money can continue paying the payroll of the people I have back. And so it feels good to at least be feeding, you know, about 300 uh, Boston, you know, restaurant people. The, the, the tragedy, the, everyone has their own story, but the ones that, that I love, still lose sleep on and, and have cried enough tears on or too many tears on, it, are the people that are under the radar, are the people that are not going to get unemployment checks and not going to get a bailout. And their last check for me was their last check until this thing clears. Um, and I have a cook that has a three month old baby. And you just ask yourself, how are they going to get through this? They can't go home. They're the ones that send money home. So there's nowhere for them to go. And, you know, thank God the landlords and, and the people that, that do have capacity are realizing we can't just start evicting everyone. And that doesn't help them either, right? They'd rather, you know, give them two months, three months, four months, or whatever, and then eventually get it back. You know, we, we, we've, been, we're, we've been lobbying. The government says, look, guys, this is what has to happen. You have to, especially for all of us that have business interruption insurance, we've been paying thousands and thousands of dollars a year for me, 22 years, for a business interruption like this. If the government just seeded the insurance company with that trillion dollars, whatever that number is, and then let us hold our heads high that we're getting our insurance money that we deserve, I mean, I, bluntly, I don't want a handout. I've been working my entire career not for a handout, right? I, I, want, I want the insurance that I'm entitled to because I've been paying for this. And, and I know there's a bunch of chefs going now to try to reason with the federal government, but... Oh my God, the, the, Jose Andres, who's our hero of all heroes, two weeks ago in Sunday New York Times had the great op-ed about if you seed and fund the restaurants, pay for their utilities, rent, food, and employees, and then let them make food for the other 300 million people in this country that need food, let all these mom and pops become food pantries, you solved a huge economic crisis. Because not only if I'm not in business, I don't buy meat and fish and I don't go to the living company and I don't use trash and recycling. I don't, my customers don't use Uber. The domino effect is trillions of dollars. You need to keep the restaurants working so much more important than keeping the cruise lines, the airlines, the gas companies solvent now. They can just borrow money. They're large enough to borrow money. All these mom and pops, there's a stat I read, 50% of all Chinese and Chinese American restaurants in this country are either closed or will be closed by the end of this. 50%. That's just crazy. Crazy. All right. I'm talking with Ming Tsai from Blue Dragon and uh, PBS Cooking and Cookbooks and you name it. Uh, Ming, I'm going to turn it over to some of the questions in our Q&A right yeah. now. Uh, we've got a question from 
uh, Rohitted or Rohit D. I'm not sure what, what the, how to pronounce that name, but the question is both restaurants and COVID thrive on crowds. How do you trade off economics and health? Is it just a pure ethical issue? Um, I, I don't quite get the gist of the question. I mean, she, is, is the uh, person suggesting that um, it's dangerous doing no contact to go, or is she saying when we come back? And yeah, I, I mean, I think it's more managing when you come back. The idea that yeah. we know that we know that you can't really have a restaurant without a crowd. We know that right. that's COVID nineteen needs to keep spreading. So yeah. how do you balance? Those it, it is. It is. It's an awesome question, and that's and this this brings me back to the the bailout that's been announced for us restaurateurs. Right, we get two point five times our monthly payroll of last year. And, and that in theory is a great number, but it doesn't include that when we do reopen, let's say June 30th, that I can bring my entire staff back. It's based on how much staff I bring back. So I can't bring my whole staff back because I may not even open for lunch ever again because people in the seaport may just work from home because that's what they're doing now. And also, it also doesn't include that I still need to pay, you know, the insurance I've been paying every day, right? The rent I still been paying every day and all these other things. And it definitely also doesn't include that if we do reopen, we're supposed to have 50% capacity. So no restaurant that I know of can just survive on 50% revenue. I mean, our margins are so tight, um, but it can be done. I mean, we've been very safe to protocol with the mask gloves, the whole nine yards with no contact. You can serve a restaurant with the waiters and the, and the cooks, everyone in masks and gloves, and it can be done very safely. And then you have to remove all the tables. The question, the million dollar question is, can any restaurant survive and break even with half your tables gone? It's going to be really hard. And like I said earlier, when I closed, people want to gather they want to hug and toast and that's you know that's why we have restaurants to be blunt so it's, it's gonna be a really hard struggle and and you know i i have to say this though please 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 believe in science for anyone i'm sure everyone listening to this are believe in science but science is real and there's still some people in certain states that are not closed down which is just baffling me that we not close this country down we've seen the data we've seen the charts it goes like this we're right behind it it's coming up um isolate we just just do do it's now don't do it for yourself do it for everyone else wear masks and isolate you have to yeah have to. another question here uh from chuck uh who's who, who says presuming full service restaurants can add some sort of panel dividers between tables or space to seat more widely and equip servers in front of house people with strong PPE. Can, are you confident that you can keep uh, both the meals and the back of the house folks safe from a production standpoint? So I guess yeah. this, again, coming back in, are yeah. you imagining a world where there's PPEs for your staff and stuff, but can you, can you keep everything safe in that production line from back of house to front of house? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the question is you can do it, but you have to then have half the cooks. You can't have a cooks next to each other like we used to. So like right now, today, you know, every six feet is a cook, mask, gloves, the hair net, the whole nine yards. So if you have half the cooks and half the tables, you're doing half the revenue. So the question is, how many months can you do that before, before you're done, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it, it's an interesting idea. I mean, there's even air curtains that apparently can keep people apart from each other. And like you said, plexiglass, whatever. And um, the paradigm shifting. And I think a lot of us are thinking and looking at different ways to re- Define your food and beverage offering, right? I think I think to go food kits and to go food and all these services are going to continue to go out of you know off the charts. I think there's restaurants becoming grocery stores, right? So they have the kits and things like that. I think we all, you know, I, I'm just so glad I don't have a 500 seat restaurant, right? Can you imagine? And you to, so now you're only doing 250 max. So that you're not going to cut it. So you just have to figure out, and believe you me, if I had the answer, uh, that would be awesome, but how to, how to keep, keep the revenue coming, but it's going to be in a different form. It's not just going to be table service, and that affects everyone. I mean, think of every waiter in this country. How do they survive? They survive on tips, and that's from being all over you literally right and now that that's kind of pulled away you're going to be you know asking from six feet away how was your meal so the whole like, dynamic of service and you become coming to my family that's that's just changing uh not for the better right i mean 
we are restaurants have always been the place of solace and celebration and you know you're, you're really depressed and you need to do this are you really happy you do that and if you have the six feet separation with plexiglass walls i mean that's that's uh, that's more than yeah. just a little inconvenience all right ming i gotta let you go in a minute but before i do what All are right. you cooking at home and what should we be cooking at home ah, well, I, I just did a live on pbs food we just did a it was actually really simple it was a hot and sour chicken noodle soup so sour from vinegar <laughs> hot hot from chili chicken and big egg noodles it's a good dish all right ming Tsai, thanks for uh hey, good. dude thank you hey. chefs thank you guys be good be kind be kind we're now going to move on to our next speakers here for the evening. Uh, I'm going to welcome up to the screen, I guess, here, we would say, uh, Katrina Jazzieria and Josh Lewin. Uh, they are the folks behind Juliet, uh, a restaurant in Somerville, and uh, hoping they're going to pop up on my screen any minute now here. And uh, we're going to chat with them a little bit about how things are going. There they are, Katrina and Josh. Welcome. Hey there. Hello. How are we doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, start us off um, and tell us a little bit about who you guys are and uh, and how you came to do what you do. And tell us about Juliet. Tell us about you for for folks uh, who maybe haven't been there. So Josh and I come from kind of different backgrounds that both brought us to the food industry, um, and we. Um, opened our first restaurant, Juliet, um, as you mentioned, in Somerville, just over four years ago. Um, and at the time, and I believe still, we were the first restaurant in the state to pay all of our staff um, a full wage, including all of our service staff. Um, and we also practice an open book kind of management model, so really engaging um, our whole team and how to run a business. Um, and since then, we've also opened um, a restaurant named Peregrine, uh, which opened about nine months ago, um, right on Charles Street in Beacon Hill. Um, I'll let Josh jump in as well. Yeah, so between the two restaurants, we have about 60 seats plus a couple more that can come out around the bar. So two very small restaurants. Um, and at Peregrine, we're completely closed uh, with the current situation and one of the main reasons that we're closed there is due to concerns around commuting and also the fact that we're in a hotel. Uh, so there were um, issues with multiple uses of the same space. Um, and at Juliet, we're almost completely closed. We're offering um, a little bit of takeaway uh, food on the weekends. This week, we're actually taking a break and redesigning how that looks with the staff. And this is all kind of a day-by-day -day response as things change and as we consider not just um, financial realities of our business, uh, which we heard Ming Tsai say a little while ago, his restaurants were reduced to about 10% revenue based on what they were able to do right now, which is almost exactly the same uh, for us. Uh, we, um, the math for us came out to about 8%. Um, so we're living in a strange uh, business reality where the finance really doesn't make sense. So we start thinking about the other areas that we impact with the work that we do. So obviously if finance can't um, allow us to become sustainable, then we have a real issue at hand with whether or not we can even continue to do business. But at the moment, we're just proceeding ahead, um, trusting that we'll see ourselves through as a society, as a community, um, to the other side of this. And in the meantime, thinking about other important aspects of who we are and what we do as a business that are less finance related. So issues um, with how staff learn and are trained and interact with their work and how we exist as part of our communities have kind of taken the forefront of what we do. Um, in yeah, I'm, I'm interested in both, uh, you know, Katrina, what you talk about that idea of, of the, the model for paying your staff and also the open book policy that you, you sort of mentioned in terms of running the business. Talk a little bit of more about what that means and how it's different from maybe how a lot of restaurants do things. Yeah, so um, it's a, you know, basically the concept is we let, we let folks in, um, our team at all levels, about how we make decisions in the restaurants, um, you know, our value systems and principles that we, that brought us to want to be business owners. Um, and we share that process with them as well as uh, the primary focus of open book management is a financial one um, to sort of engage people to understand how a business runs and their role in impacting different lines of the profit and loss statement, um, which is actually becoming, you know, really 
beneficial to us at, at this moment where we can go to our staff and, and engage on these fronts and there's the vocabulary kind of in place to say, you know, like Josh is saying, okay, we no longer have revenue as our primary driver. Um, you know, that sort of goes counter to what most businesses define themselves as, but we consider ourselves to have many different bottom lines um, that include, you know, our, our staff, the kind of company that we are, um, the stakeholders that are outside of our business, whether it's our vendors and the community at large. So we're looking at, you know, how do we engage on those fronts um, and having the ideas come from the very people who will help us um, kind of put it into action, um, which is really a, a blessing in this moment to not, you know, we feel it's easy to feel alone in many different ways um, and to be able to have this kind of like really committed, engaged staff who wants to, you know, be coming up with ideas and working through problems um, in this moment is, is really wonderful. So like logistically, how has that worked kind of through this, you know, it's obviously like extraordinary times, but also like <clears throat> sort of fairly fast moving, right? Like you, you sort of had, you had this sort of ramp up to this where it became clear that people were going to need to close. And then surely you, you had to make a whole bunch of decisions about how are we going to do this and how are we going to move forward? And that was probably changing moment to moment. So how did this sort of collaboration or this collaborative spirit kind of that you talk about with you and your staff, how did that manifest itself as, as this sort of last few weeks have unfolded? Um, yeah, well, like you said, it happened quickly and it's continuing to change uh, day by day. Um, we're here about a, a month into the mandated closures of dining rooms um, and two weeks plus since the federal government announced um, payments and programs through the CARES Act, and we still haven't figured out like the best ways to apply for those. This is you know a lot of confusion, not just with the logistics, although that was an issue too. Um, the banks actually being able to accept these applications, which might be interesting for people to hear, um, but also the way that the uh, act kind of affects restaurants specifically. All kinds of um, confusion about how and when you hire people uh, back to a. Um, secure these loans. So all the, this confusing information, which didn't even exist in its basic way until about two weeks into the crisis. So we just kind of on day one said, all right, we're going to get the staff together, communicate everything that we do know. And the first thing we're going to communicate is the fact that, well, we don't really know that the information is hard to stay on top of and you know what we're doing and even just telling them kind of step by step of what are we doing now? What we're doing is first, we're going to get to a basic agreement together on how the next three days are going to go. Then we're going to try to give you a week and then we're going to start looking beyond that. And what we're doing in the meantime is just trying to gather all the best information that we can, um, which, you know, is kind of an interesting position to put yourself in in front of the staff but we had a lot of practice with that because that's basically the way we run our business which is to say we don't have all the answers we're going to tell you the thought process behind the answers that we do have and we're going to tell you the questions that are still outstanding we're going to as the leaders of the company uh, first ourselves and now with a leadership team that includes um, eight other people or we uh, count on them to take those outstanding issues and bring proactive um, potential uh, solutions to the table and then from that that actually trickles down to our staff so all of that is vocabulary just involved with how we run Friday night's dinner service this is how we, we work so that left us a little bit better prepared to respond uh, to the crisis situation and one of the things that we came up with as we started transitioning out of day-to-day -day food service and um, into well, how are we going to exist for now? Well, we want to train, we want to learn, we want to interact, we want to reach our community, we want to feed our community if we can, uh, whether that's directly or indirectly, and um, thoughts about what indirectly might mean kept coming up again and again. Um, so as a company, we run two restaurants now, and we also, for a couple of years, have been involved in various media projects for entertainment and information of the public. And we um, operate a magazine, we print a magazine, it's we're three years of that now. Um, we also have a, a, a book out. There it is. Well, <laughs> the magazine. Nice. Um, so it's actually a physical, actual yeah. magazine. Fascinating. Yeah, you, you can so buy it and you can own it and you can hold it, but you everything. Hold it. 
almost so it's everything. Like, it's, like an I, it's like an iPad, yeah. but it's like, it, but it's like a bunch of different <laughs> <iPads>. paper. <laughs> Sorry, you can't really yeah. see it with the light behind it. Um, but almost everything we do is also available for free online. So there's a print version, but for a long time, we've always made these things available for free. Uh, we want as many people to be able to enjoy it and experience it as we can. We have a lot of people on the staff who are artists and designers and um, writers. writers and interested in these kind of projects anyway. Uh, in response to the crisis and you everybody wants to know what can I cook right now out of my pantry like what can I do we actually have um, a book out in three parts called bean zine um, and that's available in three different volumes all of which are available for free online but can also be purchased uh, and this is all about the things we actually pulled the public hey what's in your pantry what kind of recipes do you need and then we had each of the chefs from our different restaurants put their take on the same ingredients so all these different ways of looking at the things that you're probably stockpiling for now. And from there, we actually moved into some video work too. So I'm um, currently distributing the video through Instagram TV, but um, everything from cooking tutorials to bar tutorials, actually the cocktails that you see Katrina and I brought to the happy hour today, um, our manager, Sam Mangino at Juliet, taught you how to make these cocktails on Instagram today. Um, and then what engaging- what are, Wait, wait, what are they? Uh, we ha it's a take on a Negroni. Uh, so a good one for for early in the evening yeah. and then engaging with the rest of our team too so that what you're seeing from that video content isn't just about the restaurants but is about who we and they are as people um, so everything from teaching how to do a handstand to how to make a crossword puzzle um, to recipes that have nothing to do with the restaurants and people just sharing a little bit of themselves and these are things that as a company we've always been very interested in and we've been engaged in but what we actually have now is time we've like like we've never had before. So what's always been kind of a hobby, a hobby for ourselves and our staff has moved into more of a primary role when our primary business model has been interrupted. And we're taking payments for these things on kind of a pay what you can basis. And we've had a lot of great support from that. Um, but we just like, want to stay engaged. Um, and and yeah, that's uh, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're four weeks in, and a, yeah. A so you're not really that. So you haven't different. you haven't been staying busy. You're just no. Yeah, well, busy, and hand. that's another thing. We that's we awesome. need to be busy, and I think from a mental health and a physical health standpoint, we have like inertia is real, and we've come to this like full stop almost overnight uh, for not just ourselves and our business, but for the fifty people that are impacted directly by our business who work for us. Do you think that's good? Sure do you think that's particularly hard for folks in, in your industry, which is such a high octane, like oftentimes large, long hours, like, you know, just it's, it is a go, go, go industry. So like, is, is that idea of like, I can't go in and do this thing that I do is, do you think that's particularly difficult? It's right very now? difficult. It's very difficult. Um, even just from a, you know, kind of mental health standpoint. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving the people who are, um, impacted by the work that we do and who help us do the work that we do day, day to day. We couldn't do it without them. Um, trying to just be creative about how we stay engaged with them uh, for those reasons as well. So it's not really about money or revenue. Those questions will become very, very important in not too long. Um, but for today, um, there's all these other ways that we can remain a, a part of people's lives and keep the momentum going and the learning going that make the business stronger on the other side of this, even though this is so, so difficult in the moment. And sort of replace that, um, replace the kind of satisfaction and the joy that we get, um, especially speaking from the front of house perspective of getting to see people enjoy something, uh, learn something that you can, you know, teach them about a producer or about a farmer or things that, you know, those conversations that happen across the table. Um, you know, to extend those kinds of interactions to our staff directly now. Um, in that high octane and constant kind of environment, you often, um, you know, miss these chances of connecting with the people closest to you, uh, your coworkers. Um, and, you know, now having two restaurants, one of the, you know, we're looking for silver linings of all of this. And one of them is that we've now been able to come together as a, an entire company and kind of have, you know, we have a digital book club and different, you know, we get together for our own family meal once a week uh, where we all Zoom and uh, talk, you know, just talk together and like get to know each other. Um, so certainly one of the things that we will continue appreciating in the future, but kind of acts as a replacement of you know, the interactions that used to happen with our guests and the, you know, broader community, we're trying to keep that, um, keep that feeling going, um, because I think it's, 
important to most of us, if not all of us, and what brought us to the industry um, in the first place? Uh, you know, at the heart of it is the, is the kind of making of food, and you guys are still doing that in one of your restaurants, you said, for takeout. Not this weekend, but at least occasionally you're doing takeout at uh, Juliet in Somerville. Uh, what kind of stuff are you doing? How can people kind of get there to, to get some if they want to support you guys? Is it helpful for people to come and, you know, help keep that 8% revenue at 8% kind of deal? Yeah, kind of a complicated question. Um, the revenue from what we're doing from a food per service perspective is basically not part of a uh, realistic profit and loss statement for the restaurant. So if you're looking for ways to support us, um, I wouldn't even necessarily say that coming and having dinner is the best way. If you want to have dinner and you want that experience, we have um, cooks who live down the street who are commu commuting by walking, um, a, a, keeping social distancing in place while they're working and trying to put together meals that are of a Juliet style that we can share with you. And if you want that to be part of your Friday night, that's why we want you to come and have it. Um, if you just wanted to support the restaurant, there's other opportunities to do that too, from um, the products that are available online to gift card sales um, and the books and the magazines and um, opportunities to contribute on a pay what you can basis for the video content. All of that is just as helpful. Um, and we don't necessarily need you to come across town out of your way because you feel an obligation to support us for dinner. If we can safely be part of your weekend um, meal plans, we'd love to be. Um, but it's not even really about financial support at this at this state, stage. It's more about connection and interaction with what is available, what we're producing. Um, we'd love to inform and entertain you um, in that way too. So uh, the revenue is almost, it's silly to even speak of it, but we're here, we're doing things, we're working, um, we're putting things out there that we believe in and we'd love you to interact with them in whatever way works for you. So to get to um, family meal itself, or that, which is what we call our takeaway service, um, the JulietSomerville.com website is the best place and you'll get an announcement right when you arrive about how to get on that list. And on that site, we also have a web store where these products are available. Um, the video content is on our Instagram, um, and we have another website for the media productions, which is of Juliet, ofjuliet.com, um, where you can read the magazine for free. You can get all of the um, cooking in the time of Corona bean zine recipes completely for free. Um, and you can um, find a link to the video content, all of which you can also purchase. And you'll find those links too, but it's all available to enjoy while you're there as well. Nice. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to some of our... Uh, viewer questions and thank you for being with us for our virtual Boston talks. Uh, if you are just joining us, I'm talking with Katrina Jazieri and Josh Lewin. Uh, they are the folks behind uh, Juliet and Peregrine. Uh, is that right, Peregrine? Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Yeah, I'm thinking about Miss Peregrine, the the Falcon children's book thing. Yeah, do you guys know that movie? No. Yeah, well, look it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we've got uh, a Q&A uh, section. You can access it at the bottom of your screen if you haven't, where you can ask questions. I'm going to turn over some of them. Uh, this is a question uh, from Amy Traverso, and I like this question. I'm going to sort of expound upon it, but she, she's basically asking, uh, are there restaurants in other cities that are coming up with interesting models that could help Boston restaurants weather this storm? And I'll expand that out to you know, do you do you talk with other folks who own restaurants and stuff like that? Have you been talking a lot with them through this? And are there restaurants either in Boston or elsewhere who you're batting ideas around about like surviving and future business models and all of that? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, uh, it's difficult to stay on top of the information um, as it changes day by day. And it's also been a little bit of a difficult pivot into just finding time at the end of the day. Um, and you know, our primary focus is on our team for the most part, um, in all kinds of ways, training and just engagement and, and all the rest. Um, but we are a part of a, a couple of ongoing conversations. Um, some just kind of ad hoc locally and others more, um, formally through the James Beard Foundation and the Independent Restaurants Coalition. Um, who are uh, working on a local level, both from just an advice and sharing of best practices um, level, and then all the way up to advocacy at this local and state level and at the federal level, um, dealing with issues like the CARES package and it being a little bit overly confusing um, and 
unaware of some of the specific challenges for the food service business. So everything from like really local, what are we going to do today? How are our vendors impacted? What kind of opportunities are around? Uh, Ming, uh, as I earlier mentioned, people who are ineligible for unemployment benefits for uh, all kinds of reasons um, and dealing with um, getting some information into the hands of people af affected by the lack of employment for those reasons too, all the way up to the people who are renegotiating CARES packages um, and those things. And kind of the, the thread throughout all of it is everybody wants to know what everybody else is doing and we're always happy to share and happy to listen, but there's just still a lot of confusion in the day to day, uh, both in terms of how we respond today and um, long-term planning for how we start to look at the future. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of questions uh, from folks here uh, that are sort of dealing with the with the with basically servers, right? Like, so what what is what is the role of the server going to be as this pandemic grows and as we come back from it? But also questions about you know, for example, you know, paid sick leave is something that a lot of uh, it, servers don't enjoy, right? So now we're talking about an entire industry being under stress in a way you know that they've never been before they're they're not terribly profitable to begin with for most of them right so basically i think you know there's a few questions here servers are in a tough spot and so what are your thoughts on that and, and what the future of that is like as, as a job yeah i mean i think that this is sort of tragically shining a light on something that we've been aware of and actually is is some of the reason we opened a business the way we did was realizing that the that the uh, wage inequity between how everyone else in the world is paid and how service workers are paid be uh, meaning the the tipped minimum wage um, is sort of you know setting people up to be in such a state of insecurity that you know any you know this is obviously an outsized and you know it's it's global and it's huge but the same uh, a same scenario could happen to a server who breaks their foot you know and they're they're unable to do their job um they go to apply for unemployment insurance and realize that they haven't been making enough wages or their wages haven't been declared properly or all these all these confounding issues that that lead from that tipped wage um, are now going to be a detriment um, in the future and and people aren't really prepared uh, or fully understand that when they enter the system i don't think um, and so that's why we were committed from you know from day one to not having that disparate wage um, so that everyone um, is sort of at you know at an equal starting point um, and that they have that reliance on this is a real job it's my profession it's my career um, and there's stability in that and that there are certain things you should look to your employers to kind of help you along you know we're we're being as supportive as we can to our workers about okay let's go through you know let's go through this application process and what do you need to get ready and who qualifies who doesn't qualify what are the reasons how can we be helpful um, so I think, you know, I think this is going to be a wake up call for a lot of people that there are certain things about our industry that, you know, it, are long overdue for a, for a redesign. Um, and, and I think, and I think the, the impact to service workers in particular is going to be at the forefront of that. Um, and I think, you know, just like just like with all of this, we don't know what a week is going to look like from now. We don't know what two months is going to look like. Um, and that, but I do know that, you know, of of any industry, um, the hospitality industry is one that um, can be very dynamic um, when called upon. And I think we're going to come up with we're going to come up with a way that the future looks for restaurants. That you know, if we put people first um, and and really hold on to that and remember who is involved in in making you know the comforts and routine of our daily life possible um that we're going to come out on the other side and and you know take care of people is this i mean is this going to forever change the restaurant industry like is is that is that already done like you you know what i'm saying like or is it, is it still possible that this is like everybody's going to kind of hang on, survive, some will go away, whatever, and you know, a year from now, two years from now, the restaurant industry looks very much the way it did before? 
or do you feel like at this point you're already looking at it going like this is going to be completely altered i think there's just there's no way to know um you know if this is uh if this goes until the first week of May and things start to go back to normal and we have graduation season, I think everybody listening is probably local to Boston, but you know, the restaurant business is cyclical um, and really hinges on a couple of big portions of the year. Uh, the holiday season, uh, the fall season and the, the college graduation season are, are big ones for the Boston market. Um, and if, but if it doesn't, if it's more like June, July, August, um, I think it's a different conversation. So it's really depends on time. It depends on what types of restaurants can weather the storm. It depends on uh, the federal response and getting relief money into people's hands and whether we're left with more established restaurants, uh, corporate um, owned restaurants that can rely on resources and go further into debt comfortably. Um, it, it really depends on who's still part of that landscape on the other side of the crisis, which is mostly a time-based question and secondarily a relief response question. Um, and that will actually, I think, inform a lot more of what type of change we see and how long lasting it is, as well as how quickly it comes to be. Um, depending on how the loans are handled from the federal response, you're gonna have businesses taking loans and um, it might look like things are okay for a little while, but there may be another six to eight month period after business has gone back um, that debt starts becoming due. And so you know, there's a couple of, um, which may really, really impact small businesses um, if their revenues can't get into a place or if they do miss certain important calendar benchmarks in the cyclical business season, all things that I really don't love to talk about. This is very boring conversation to me, but these are things that will make or break the landscape and will totally change um, what it looks like on the other side of this. And we may not know until six, eight months, 12 months after things reopen, um, because it'll depend on how quickly things can get back to a sustainable benchmark. And it's not just about being allowed to open uh, because loans and, and debt and, and different arrangements can keep things afloat for a little while. Uh, but I think we really won't know until we see uh, the final restructuring of what that looks like, the final reckoning. And it, it has to do with how long it takes from now um, and what kind of relief resources are available to those that really need them. Um, the small businesses that employ tons and tons and tons of workers and workers that really need good jobs. Um, and that'll make all the difference. All right. Uh, I got to let you go, but just like I did with uh, Ming, and I know there's, you've given us plenty of resources where I can get cooking ideas uh, from the folks on your staff, but what are you guys cooking at home? What should we be cooking at home? We're cooking all the same things you are, all those pantry staples that you stocked mm -hmm. up on, and we put three whole uh, cookbook volumes out for you. Um, you can buy them from us, or you can get everything for free online. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, Katrina and Josh, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, good luck. Stay safe. Stay sane. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having us. Uh, we have got one more guest uh, to speak with today, uh, and I think we're going to welcome him to the screen right now. Uh, this is uh, this is Air Muir, who is the man behind Clover. Um, waiting for him to pop up. Maybe he's here. Maybe he's not. We do hope he's here. Ah, uh, there he is, Air. Welcome to Virtual Boston Talks. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for staying patient. You know, when we do the regular Boston Talks, when you're the last speaker, uh, it's, it's not that, you know, it, it, it's not a big deal. There's a lot of people there. You got the bar, you're hanging out. But here, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. So thank you for that. Well, I figured it meant everybody's a few in, so it doesn't really matter as much what I say. The pressure's yeah. off, yeah. right? The pressure's off. Everybody's hammered right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I've I've been uh, I've been enjoying listening to everybody else. Um, I, I I love Ming and I'm really good friends with Katrina and um, Josh. Katrina's sister Lucia actually uh, works for Clover and has worked for us for a long time. So we've got Good. some connections that go way back. Oh, amazing! Well, you know, before we get really into this, just give us a little overview for folks who don't know. Give us a little overview of Clover, uh, who you are. You guys kind of have a little bit of a different thing that you do. So give us the sort of thumbnail sketch of what Clover is all about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um. It's a little anticlimactic because I can describe what we do and you can't go in and, and uh, you know, go get a sandwich. But um, I started Clover about 10 years ago. We started with food trucks. Um, the idea was uh, I was trying to figure out if there was a way to sell um, meals without meat to people who love eating meat. 
And so that's, that's, that's a mission we have is to help people who, who love eating meat eat some meals in their day, in their week, in their month that have no meat. And, um, and so this has been uh, um, you know, a, a mission we've worked on for 10 years. Um, we've been, I think, a lot more successful than I expected with it, really. Um, at the beginning, I wasn't even sure it worked, so we started with a food truck. And then four years later, we had um, 10 food trucks operating. We were the biggest food truck, uh, branded food truck operator in the country, and we had the highest volume trucks in the country. And then we transitioned to restaurants from there. Um, and now we operate uh, 13 restaurants in the Boston area. Um, so we're fast casual. I mean, if you're, if you're not familiar with Clover, don't expect to spend more than $10 when, when you come by. Um, we sell sandwiches, soups, salads. Um, and, uh, and, and what we source, the menu changes all the time. And that allows us to get our customers' dollars to farmers, um, which is actually sort of, for us, I mean, we normally spend... 60, 80 cents on every dollar we spend on food is to a local purveyor. So for us, that's one of the um, sort of added elements of all of this is those folks that we've built relationships with and we've become a very important part of their business and help support their farming and other things they're doing, which I really love. Um, you know, all of a sudden we have to turn to them. You know, I've turned to my employees and say, we don't have uh, work for you, but I have to turn to my suppliers and say, I can't buy from you right now. And, uh, and there's, it's not something we've talked about so much in this already, but that there's a lot of hardship hitting distributors and producers um, who normally expect restaurants to be buying from them. Yeah, let's let's actually get into that a little bit because uh, there were a few questions in the Q and A section from a number of people who were asking about the the sort of supply chain side of things. So, you know, what what is that looking like? What is that looking like? And are they feeling pain now? Do you expect that they're gonna be feeling pain? Like, what, what are there things you can't get? Like, wh where are we at on the supply chain side of things as far as you understand it? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, maybe second to cruise ships, companies and, and airlines, you know, restaurants have felt the brunt of this. Um, but I think right behind us, probably distributors. And you have to remember a lot of these distributors, you know, there are regional distributors in Boston that we work with. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful guy who runs a distribution company called Shirazi, and he ferries a lot of the produce from Western Mass to Clover and uh, has made it possible for us to sell some really beautiful products that we really couldn't sell before we knew Josh, uh, who runs that company. It's like a three-generation company. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, his only customers are restaurants. So, I mean, as we shut down, he shuts down. And he has all this inventory that he was expecting to sell everybody, right? So, I mean, he, when I call him up and I order products from him, he has to have them ready to deliver to the store that day or the next day. So in order to do that, he has a, a warehouse and, uh, and all of a sudden he can't sell that product. So we, um, we worked with Josh and some of the other um, suppliers that we love so much to try to help them out. Um, in the early days of our shutdown, we set up uh, like pantry boxes so customers could come in and get a box of stuff. And we, we also did some things where we helped some of those suppliers sort of set up on a street corner, but we'd promote it. We'd let our customers know they're gonna be there to sort of try to sell down some of the supplies, especially the perishable products. Uh, but, you know, I think we've, we've been able to help a few, um, but I think the pain is probably very broad, you know, and, uh, and it's not just the people we work with, it's, it's all of these distributors in the region, and then it's the suppliers that uh, provide product to them. So the, this is uh, something that's affecting you know, restaurants and on back. And I think, I don't know if this is something people think of, but a lot of times the people who supply restaurants are different than the people that supply grocery. And they're not the same business. They have different margins. They have different channels of operation. So, you know, when I talked to Josh, I said, can you sell this through grocery? And, you know, his answer is just, well, a lot of most of the grocery chains, you need to be certified. You need to go through process of being onboarded as an official supplier. And I'm not through any of that. So I don't know how I'm going to get through that in 10 yeah. days, you know? Wow, that's tough. So what, uh, what are you doing at your restaurants, if anything, how, like, you know, as, you know, as the crisis kind of hit, how, you know, how quickly did you have to make a decision? What decision have you made and why? Yeah, so we made a, we made a pretty quick decision. Um, you know, I think probably quicker than most in our industry. Uh, I, I did not expect we would have, um, I didn't expect we could, we could operate without diners coming in. And so, um, you know, the day after Charlie Baker announced that restaurants had to be takeout only, we, we uh, furloughed 
all of our employees, including me, um, and we uh, shut down all of our restaurants. So it's a temporary pause, obviously, you know, until we can get back open. But um, uh, we did that all at once. I think it was a good way for us to handle it um, because I think it was a clean communication to our employees. We have about 300 employees. So yeah. um, I didn't feel, personally, as this was developing, I uh, really didn't like the idea that I might be asking someone to go into work and interact with the public or whatever else, and, and who knows what's going to happen. And I think that um, that's very much on my mind with the reopen, too. I really need some sort of um, testing or something in place because I just don't, personally, I don't like the idea of asking people to go into work and expose themselves. Or, and maybe some, you know, people have all different kinds of family situations, right? And if one of my employees got sick and brought it home and then one of their, you know, and they had a parent who um, is older and susceptible, like I'd feel horrible. And, you know, we, I think what we do is really important, but it's not, we're not a hospital, you know, we're not critical in that kind of fashion. So um, it just seems the right thing to do to pause everything until we knew more. And, and that's sort of where we are right now. All right. So what are you, so, so what are you up to personally then in terms of like, are you like scheming the future? Or are you, you know, kind of adjusting and, and pivoting and doing different things? What are you up to? Well, I'm playing with food, um, and uh, you know, well, You're <laughs> I, was, in the lab. I was listening to everybody <laughs> here, but I, I'll admit I'm in my kitchen right now. So I, while I wasn't on the camera, I, I, I'm making food for my uh, for my kids for dinner. Are you and, literally making food right now? Yeah, and, and pulling, pulling some bread out of the oven. So I just uh, I just pulled this this out of the oven. It's one of the recipes I've been working on. Um, there's a guy, Richard Bourdon, who's an amazing baker. Yeah, he does the slap method, right? Where yeah. He, like, yeah. And so uh, I called him up when this all started. I had this idea of starting a cooking show for people. And I, I you know, I say, Richard, who, who I, I knew a bit, but I've gotten known much better. We've been on the phone like three times a day. And I said, what can we do that people can do at home? You know, we can teach people how to just use wheat. They might not even have yeast. So we've been working on a recipe for a spontaneously fermented bread where you just start with water and flour and nothing else. And, um, and it's uh it's, so it's been fun we're, we're we're getting there um i i've had a lot of failures like that one looks really good but you could have caught me two days ago and it would look like a brick um but we've been playing around with that and uh I, i've been doing a cooking show so i think um, that's where we'll probably feature some of the bread recipes as we get those um honed in but we've been doing a live show every day at four o'clock on weekdays um my thinking was it'd be nice for people to have something to look forward to and it's pretty peaceful. I mean, we try to cover like one or maybe two things and it's real time. So it's sort of like the anti-cooking show, you know, instead of like, I did this and this and this, and I'm showing you some beautiful thing which you don't expect to make at home. You're watching me drop a spoon and do things like that. But, um, but also hopefully learning how to make some nutritious, delicious things that use pantry staples. And I, I know there are a lot of people stuck at home and I know that a lot of people don't know how to cook. So I'm hoping we can, we can help people out uh, in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so where do I get like if I'm interested in this cooking show, where do I go, and how quickly? Yeah, I'm not good at promoting the stuff yet, am I? Yeah, so it's on. it's uh we're doing it on YouTube. It's called In Air's Kitchen. So I probably if you go to YouTube and type in A Y R, I'll come up because it's a pretty unique name. But it's called yeah, yeah, In Air's yeah. Kitchen, and uh, you can watch all the previous episodes and you can watch us live at four o'clock. So is this, is this like a, for you, is this like a, I've always dreamed of having a cooking show and now is my moment? Or are you like, I never thought I would have a cooking show and this is weird that I'm doing it? No, I'm not. Um, I like watching the cooking shows. I like watching Ming. Uh, but no, it's nothing I ever dreamed of doing. But I, I just felt, you know, as we were trying to think about what role, um, you know, we can play, I think it's very tempting, you know, there's a part of me that would love just to take a little vacation. Um, you know, we work very hard in this industry, but uh, but I also feel like there's um, there's needs and there's things that we can offer. So I, I thought this might be a way to help people cook at home. Um, we're also trying to figure out um, whether there are ways sort of maybe as Clover's getting started again to help find ways to connect the customers that love Clover and we love and we have a wonderful mailing list of like 150,000 people who, you know, are awesome when we re reach out to them. And, um, and if you're not in the mailing list, you can go to the website and sign up. But we, we try that to was better promotion right there that time. Well, done. like that, I'm, I'm yeah. I, I learn, I you learn are a quick learner for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we, um, 
we're we're uh, we're trying to connect people with our farms and things like that using the you know that platform. We're also trying to think. I'm personally very concerned that we may have a situation where there are a lot of hungry people in our community, and um, you know I, I'm afraid some of those hungry people may be people who used to work for me or other restaurants. So depending on how this unfolds, um, I think we may find that there's some larger societal burdens. I think Ming's working on this right now, which is awesome. I'm trying to think of ways that we may be able to scale that. Um, you know, I think what Ming's doing is amazing, but 300 meals, I mean, we might be talking about needing 30,000 meals a day, you know, or 60,000 meals a day. And I'm curious how that might play out. So we've been playing around and I'd be interested if people watching this, um, you know, how willing would you be to, uh, you know, if you bought a meal for yourself, also donate a meal for somebody else. I mean, I think that we're probably going to have to all pitch in together to take, I, I think we have the resources and we have uh, the heart and we have the people in this region to, to get through all of this, but we are probably going to have to find creative solutions and we're going to have to find ways to pitch in and help out our neighbors. What, what, what are you looking at where you say, like, I think we're going to need to feed more people than we think we're going to have to? Like, what, what's happening in your brain and what are you seeing that that's what you're forecasting or at least even considering? Yeah, I mean, I guess it probably hinges on a couple things. One is I, I just think the impact on the restaurant industry, you're getting hints of this from Ming. And, and Ming, Ming makes some really good points. Like, we all pay this insurance, business interruption insurance, then all of a sudden our business are interrupted and they say, sorry, we'll deny those claims, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty amazing feeling from our side. Um, but uh, I think that we're, we're looking at a long recovery. You know, this isn't going to be we flip a switch. And restaurants, we measure our performance. Are we up 4% versus last year, down 3%? I can tell you most restaurants, if they're down 8% versus last year, they're having trouble meeting payroll. And we're looking at an environment where we might come back and we might see sales at 50% of what they were. Um, you know, and so I think how do you then operate and how do you move forward from there? It's going to be a hard uh, hoe. And I know we're not going to be able to hire back all 300 people day one, you know, um, of when Governor Baker says restaurants can reopen, right? So it's going to be a sequential, you know, step-by-step -step process and we'll get there to something that feels normal again, but it's going to take time. And in that time, I think there's going to be a lot of people in pain. Um, and I also think another piece of this is, and you know, I think um, Josh and Katrina mentioned this a little bit and Ming mentioned this a little bit, but we have some really good programs that are supporting people on unemployment and stuff like that, but there are people that slip between the cracks. You know, I have employees who are, you know, we, we don't do any cash payments or under the table or anything. Clover, we're, we, we're uh, you know, a lot of restaurants do, we're a bigger organization, so we don't do that. But I have employees who are legal status for working, but they're not yet citizens and they want to apply for citizenship you know, in the next two years. And they're afraid, even though they've been paying into unemployment every month with their paycheck, they're afraid to claim the benefits because they're afraid it'll be held against them if they try to become a citizen in a few years. So they're holding off from it and trying to figure out what to do. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I, we'll have to see how this all unfolds, but I think that there are a lot of people in really difficult situations. And, um, you know, the maybe the most base thing is we can help at least make sure everybody's fed and has a has some empathy with that food and that it's not, you know, it's food that tastes great and is exciting. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Talking with Air Muir, uh, I'm going to turn to some of the listener Q&A uh, questions here. Uh, I got a question here from Nicholas uh, who asks, will the restaurant industry have to develop a totally new model of business before the 12 to 18 months or so have passed when sort of imagining a vaccine or something's available then? Or is it changed for the future already at this point? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the hard thing of this is there's a lot of it, questions we don't have answers to, right? Um, the, you know, I, I think my business is a little different than the sit-down dining. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I have friends who operate other, other chains in Boston, um, you know, Tate, Life Alive, um, uh, you know, Boloco, um, just thinking of a few, uh, Saloniki, uh, you know, uh, whole heart provisions. I mean, these are all people I talk to and I know really well, and we're all root for each other I and mean, we're competitors, but we all want one another to do well. And, um, you know, a lot, those, most of those I know who tried to stay open, you know, we, we shut down right away, but a lot of those who tried to stay open, we're hoping that, and I think there's maybe this expression in the popular media that, Oh, 
the meals are changing. People aren't going in anymore, but now they're ordering out. But most people are seeing that their, their takeout orders or in their delivery orders are on the same order as what they were before the COVID. So it's like if you were doing 15% of your sales and delivery before COVID, you're doing 15% in sales delivery now. You're just not doing the other sales. Yeah. And that's why you're starting to see people start to shut down other things. It's not as though, it, it's not as though delivery made up for the losses. And, and that's, a, that's a challenge. We have, um, we've all worked really hard to make businesses that, you know, we, we have good hospitality and we deliver great food and we try and create great environments for people. And we employ a lot of people and they're well-trained. But um, when you have that kind of a business, it's not like a tech business where we can just pivot, you know, this idea of like, we can just change from one thing to another. I mean, how do I ask 300 people who've been trained how to make sandwiches every day to all of a sudden do an entirely different job? You know, it's, it's a lot to take on. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions out there we don't really have answers to yet. All right, another question from uh, one of our uh, viewers here. Uh, you mentioned you were cooking for your kids. I think we might have seen one of your kids come through the screen uh, yeah. without saying hi, which I think was rude. I mean, it's cool that your, your kid came through. I just wish they, they would have said hi. But uh, question from them, what's, what's something good and interesting and creative to cook for and with your kids? Edgar, you're intimidating. What? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm joking. Um, the, the, uh, um, it, it may be why they didn't say hi. Um, no, oh, we're, we're, uh, we're doing a lot of fun things with the kids. If you watch the show, the kids have been joining me a lot. And I think it's really, one, I enjoy doing it with them more than I would if I was just doing it alone. I think it's probably a little more entertaining because I think they're more fun to watch than I am. <laughs> uh, but I think also part of the process of making food with them keeps, uh, keeps me grounded. You know, I have to keep the recipes more simple. And I think as you're watching it from home, I'm hoping it gives people confidence they can try something. I mean, when, you know, my daughter Violet or my son Blue are like, eight or, or well, just about well, just her nine or 10 years old um they uh they can they can see that happening and, and try to take it on themselves and we've been really excited to see all the pictures of people sharing of food they're making at home so um we're uh hoping people there, there are a lot of wonderful things happening right now there's all this scary stuff and we're trying to handle it figure out good solutions but um you know we also have this opportunity to take a moment and assess our lives and um sleep a little bit more i hope people are getting good night's sleep. I know I've been sleeping more than I have in 15 or 20 years. Um, and, uh, and play with food. Uh, you know, it's, um, we, we have kitchens, we have food, you can get food if you don't. And it's a, it's a big play space. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, fun we can have. And I think as people a year from now are looking back, if anything, I could imagine people regretting they didn't take more advantage of this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like you're doing a good job of that? Are you like being weirder and experimental using new ingredients? Or are you just like, what are you, are you just plugging along? Like, yeah, you know, it's funny. Well, the Richard relationship yeah. like, um, had me doing some very odd things. Uh, the show yesterday, we played around with a few of them. He has this idea. So he, he sort of hates um, starters. And I, I learned how to make sourdough bread with starters. And uh, Richard's got like a philosophical thing against that. So he's pushed me into playing with some other things that are a little bit odd. And um, uh, he has me trying to make this like injera style bread. So it's like um, you take wheat and, and water and you leave it for a really long time. Like he told me he left one for 18 months once in his kitchen, just <laughs> uncovered. He's just like, like it's like water it's just water. For seven decades and now it's finally ready. And, uh, and then you take it. And at that point, he describes it as like a low gluten, high protein, um, low carbohydrate uh, bread. It, it's, you know, <laughs> loosely bread. It's like gloopy, but you can do funny things with it. And so I've been playing around with that a little bit, which is interesting. And you know, Richard has these ideas of where bread first came from and sort of trying to connect physically with our history and our past and our ancestors, you know, maybe 20,000, 30,000 years ago um, by thinking about, you know, how they played around with these uh, new ideas um, and fermentation, which is pretty fun. So I've, I've been enjoying that and learning a lot. Yeah. Have you, has anything, uh, like, have you learned anything about yourself that has surprised yourself about yourself during this? Do you know what I mean? Like, if you a really like, good wow, question. I, like, I, I, I would have, like, for me, like, I will say for me, like, I am watching way less television than I thought I would if somebody told me that this was going to happen six months ago, I'd be like, well, I'm just going to sit there and watch so much TV, but I haven't been. And I'm shocked yeah. that I haven't been watching more. 
Well, I would think that I would, pro I mean, I probably I would have imagined I would rest more and just sort of take it easy and enjoy the time off. Um, we all, you know, Ming works really hard. Um, Josh and Katrina work really hard. I mean, this is a very tough industry and we all are used to doing 14, 16 hour days. So uh, I think if you had told me three months ago, I was going to have the situation, I'd be like, ah, I'll just, you know, I'll lay around and read some books. And in reality, I've been a lot more busy dealing with, um, you know, keeping the business going, dealing with thinking of new ideas, dealing with the cooking show, but, um, but I'm enjoying all of it. And I think getting a good night's sleep is helping with that. It also is probably one of the best things we can do to deal with COVID. So I, I don't hear people saying this enough in the media, but like sleep nine hours, sleep 12 hours. There's, there's nothing you can do overnight that's going to improve your immune system as well as getting a good night's sleep. And, uh, and we could probably all sleep more. There you go. Words of wisdom for Air, from Air Muir. Thanks for, uh, for joining us, man. I uh, really appreciate taking the time today. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, it's a hi to everybody out there. We can't wait to get back in. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing people in the restaurants. And we can see you 4 o'clock daily. Is that it? That's right. Yep, 4 o'clock daily on YouTube in Air's Kitchen. In Air's Kitchen. All right, and my thanks to you for being with us for our very first ever virtual Boston Talks. Uh, my thanks to all my guests, for you for taking the time. Uh, stay with us. Keep an eye on WGBH events page. We are going to be doing another one of these next month. Uh, we're going to be focusing on fitness, both mental and physical, uh, at home during this uh, stay at home time. So uh, stay tuned to WGBH.org slash events for details about that upcoming.